Hi, Scott Bradfield. This is week two of writing short stories. I'm trying to learn how to, where to put the iPad and how to lean it properly and have my son just tell me how to work YouTube. It's an education for me as well as for you. And I hope so. I hope it's for both of us. And I just uh, have a few notes here. I think we all did pretty well. I, was, I enjoyed reading all of your opening paragraphs and your comments on the stories. And I think we're all moving well along the way with, that we would like to be. And I think that it's easier for me to give you specific comments on your on your work than it is normally in a classroom where we can't get everyone's uh, an opportunity to speak each week. So I'll continue trying to reply to everybody at least once during the week and encourage you to reply to one another on your work. So that's great. And I'll post uh, your this week's assignments on YouTube uh, on the on the. Moodle space page today. So we started off last week just talking about the discipline of writing, just general principles of writing and, and, and thinking about writing fiction. And tonight I wanted to talk about uh, the basic techniques and basically the shape of a story. We talked about Poe, uh, his dictum that the short story is a story, a work of fiction that could be read in one sitting. This principle of, of the story makes it aware makes us aware of it as a complete form when we when we read it we we read it we start at the beginning of a story and when we reach the end we see the entirety of that story in the same period of time that's an important aspect that poe mentions and i think i agree with him on that that we are much more critical of the shape and structure of a short story when we read it than we are of a novel you can, you can read a john grisham story and and they will be raced, being chasing, being chased across the bayous or Louisiana, and it can go on for pages and tens and hundreds of pages. And you can actually put it down and pick it up, and, and it's okay if there's some extraneous scenes. But in a short story, you're expecting a certain compactness and concision, and you don't want to be wasting your time. So, we talked about the beginning. We started to talk about the beginning, and this week I really want to talk about the beginning of a short story. The beginning of the short story is the easiest part of the story to write, in my opinion. You can almost make up a story on the spur of the moment, as long as you have a few things. You need a character, you need to know where they are, and you need to know when the story starts. And in your works this week, in your opening paragraphs, all I've tried to do is show you principles of how you can establish that clearly and quickly. A paragraph can be one sentence paragraph can be, I hate you, Bob's wife said, because that one sentence gives us a lot of information about the story. It starts at the moment that Bob's wife says she hates him. It suggests that Bob's the point of view, because it's referring to her as his wife, so Bob seems to be the perceiver of the event. And we know when it starts, and we have a conflict. We have something happening between the characters. And we can think about what it feels like to be Bob. We're in Bob's point of view as readers. A paragraph can be like the opening of Neighbors by Raymond Carver. Really worth looking at this paragraph. And the opening paragraph of every Carver story is worth looking at. Bill and Arlene Miller were a happy couple. But now and then they felt they alone among their circle had been passed by, some, passed by somehow, leaving Bill to attend to his bookkeeping duties and Arlene occupied with secretarial chores. They talked about it sometimes, mostly in comparison with the wives of their neighbors, Harriet and Jim Stone. It seemed to the Millers that the Stones lived a fuller and brighter life. The Stones were always going out for dinner, or entertaining at home, or traveling about the country somewhere in connection with Jim's work. Now that opening paragraph gives it a lot of important material. It's not information. It tells us that the main central focus of the story is Bill and Arlene Miller. It's, the, the next paragraph is not going to be about the milkman or President Obama or their dog. The subject of the story and the point of view of the story in the opening section is the couple. It also begins by telling us something about where we are and when we are. We are with a couple. Their interest is looking at the other couple next door. And now, within a few more paragraphs, the neighboring couple leave. 
and time has begun. It has begun for these two people, Bill and Arlene Miller, and it's going to go forward. We have very, very little information. Think about how little we're told and how much information we don't need to know to start a story. We don't know what Bill and Arlene look Bill and Arlene Miller look like. We don't know where they went to school. We have a little idea about what their jobs are. We don't even know what city we're in or, you know, who's the president that year or what kind of house they live in or what kind of apartment they have, not what, what, what their religions are. None of this information that many of my students want to get into the story is there. We have a couple. We have a point of view. And most importantly, we want to know what's going to happen next. Also, we have something that's already started, which is the, cap the couple, the Millers, envy somebody. They want to be somebody. They have a desire for something. Now, that's not necessarily true in every short story, but think about how often a good character at the beginning of a story wants something. You know, it could be the, the nameless character in, in the cask of Amontillado who wants to destroy, Mont uh, wants to destroy his neighbor, Fortunato, or his, his, his enemy, Fortunato. It could be the, the poor young woman waiting for the phone to ring in Dorothy Parker's story, dying and desiring that phone to ring, wanting something to happen for characters, you know, wanting to get something. Is a really good, strong opening for a story because it helps you know what's going to happen next. So in the beginning gives us a lot of information. And I take that back. It's not information. It's narrative. We know who the characters are. We've established what the language is like. So we have a style in the opening paragraph, the Carver style, but you can change that style from story to story. And it's established the real, realism of that world. How realistic is it? It's fairly real. It's not a science fiction world. It's not a romance novel world. It's not a fancy or horror novel world. It's a certain type of realistic world. Now, all of these, these stylistic choices, and all of these uh, technique, technical choices, have limited the possibilities of our story. This is a good thing for a writer. Because you don't want to be wondering what's going to happen. You, know, you don't want to start all over again with your second paragraph. You know the second paragraph takes place after the first paragraph. It takes place when the apartment is empty and we're going to go next door. So you establish some rules for yourself. Look at the end of that first scene. Now, it's always good to look at the stories, and this is backwards because it's on my iPad. You see a short story, but there's, there's your entirety of the story. Start looking at the stories. We start thinking about what they look like on the page, how they're paginated, how they're the dialogue is laid out, how scene breaks occur, how long paragraphs are in a certain type of story, and what happens in those paragraphs, and how many scenes we have in a story. This Carver lays his, his scenes out pretty clearly. He's got five or six scenes in there. He tells you when the scenes start and end. All writers don't do that, but it's, it's a very useful tool for the writer to show you when the scene ends. The second scene, second narrative bit in Neighbors, begins like this. Bill took a deep breath as he entered the Stones' apartment. The air was already heavy, and it was vaguely sweet. The sunburst clock over the television said half past eight. He remembered when Harriet had come home with the clock, how she had crossed the hall to show it to Arlene, cradling the brass case in her arms and talking to it through the tissue paper as if it were an infant. A couple of you mentioned how that image of the clock struck you. And I want to, I want to emphasize that that clock and that moment of what, seeing that clock and remembering how that clock got into the apartment isn't information. It's not a flashback. It's Bill, and now we have change point of view. Bill going into the apartment, seeing the clock, and as he sees it, remembering how it got there. That's time. Time is ticking. More importantly, or just as importantly, when we shift point of view, and I don't suggest any of you do it, not for a while, when we shift point of view for Carver, and that's a, that's a bit of an experiment for him to do this, he's established the, the couple next door, is, the couple is the point of view, when he shifts to Bill, he lets us know like that. He lets us know immediately. Bill took a deep breath as he entered the Stone's apartment. In one sentence, we know we've shifted to Bill. We know we're going to see things as Bill sees them. And Arlene's been left behind. 
Does that? I want you to really look closely when you see point of view shifts, and how often you don't see point of view shifts in Carver. When he does it, he has he has reasons to do it, but the strongest point of view is always one person. Narratively, that's that's your bread and butter. That's your bread and butter pitch, as they say in baseball. You got to have that technique down, because when a person goes into a room, you want to know what's going to happen to them that in that room. And if you don't know who's going into the room, you're not going to have that effect, that effective ability in your story. Your stories are going to happen to somebody. We have to care who that person is. And if we don't know who that person is, we have trouble. So sticking with one point of view is a good idea for the first few stories. And if you shift point of view, and you do it like Carver does, you let us know pretty, pretty quickly that you've shifted. Now we have a series of scenes, and now we're with Bill. Okay? Bill goes into the apartment. Bill leaves his wife behind. Bill is lying over there. And we're, we don't know what Arlene's doing in the story. We're, we're far away from Arlene. We're experiencing things as Bill sees them, as he feels them, as he does them. That's the middle of this story, which we, I'm going to ask you to write next week. The middle develops off the beginning. It is the fulfillment of possibilities that are brought about in the beginning of the story. I hate you, Bob's wife said, well, I don't hate you, Bob replied. Now that's not necessarily a, the world's greatest two-paragraph short story, but the second paragraph maintains the point of view of Bob. It replies to the opening paragraph. It's the next moment of time. It follows the first paragraph. And in my reading of that, those two sentences, which I've made up basically as I'm speaking to you, it makes me want to know what's going to happen in the third paragraph. I've got two people, and I'm interested. I'm in Bob's point of view because I don't like being told I'm hated, and I want to know what happens next. In a more complex way, Carver's doing that with this story. And I think we'll probably talk about the ending of the story next week when we talk about the next reading assignment from Carver, which is Fat. And look at the ending. Many people mention the ending of Neighbors. Neighbors has a shift back to the joint point of view. Look where, part, where, where Carver does that. See how effective that is when we talk about the endings for stories. Because it does something. It does something very simple. Not very complicated. It does something very simple for a short story. It, it resolves the story and the conflicts and the issues that have been set up about the happy couple becoming unhappy. It returns to our original point of view, which is the couple. And it gives that sense of form. And we'll talk about that a bit more next week. So, the last thing I'd like to leave you with is this sense of form. When you start a story, you give yourself a set of limited possibilities. You limit your possibilities. When you look at a bright piece of paper, the possibilities are infinite of what you can do. That's a, That can be a scary place. okay? But when you start a first paragraph, You've telling yourself there's only so much you've limited it. It can't it can't be about there's certain characters, a certain world, a certain set of possibilities that can happen. Even the language is sort of determined for your story. And that story will divulge certain possibilities. And that's the excitement of reading a story, is you start to divulge the possibilities of what you've set up. I mentioned Aristotle this week, and Aristotle wrote a book called The Poetics, which many many critics refer to. And it makes some very simple arguments, really. And there's two of them I find interesting. One, one of them, the main one, is that when you have, you have a beginning in a play, good, good drama has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It has a whole shape. So it begins somewhere, and it ends somewhere. In other words, you can see the entirety of that story. In other words, it's not like serial melodrama where it ends and the next week it's going to start again and then it's going to start again and then it's going to start again and it's going to carry on from certain premises but it will go on infinitely. It doesn't have an ending. It doesn't have a, co a completeness to it. It's infinitely extendable, really. You could have Grey's Anatomy in 30,000 years and still have the story going on. The ending's not as important. In the middle, in a way, it's all middle. Aristotle says that uh, the sculptor, and I'm going to leave you on this, the sculptor looks at a piece of marble. And that marble comes before the sculptor, 
and they can see the beginnings of their work in it. Maybe they're going to do a horse, they're going to do Shakespeare, or they're going to do Cicero. And they can sort of see some possibilities for finding Cicero in that, that, that piece of marble. And they'll start chipping into that marble to find the beginnings of the shape of their character. As they start making those inroads into the marble, the marble will determine how much you can do with it. There's going to be flaws in the marble, there's going to be per parts that are particularly beautiful you want to bring out, and you're going to shape your work according to that medium that you're, you're dealing with. The middle and the end of the, of the sculpture are in the beginning of it. And it's something that you sort of, it's a sort of metaphysical bit of writing that I can't teach you completely, but it is one of the pleasures. When you start and you remember the most important parts of your story, who's seeing the story, who's the point of view, what happens at the beginning of the story, and what happens next. Not what happened before the story. I've tried to point out in your many of your exercises how you would start the story and then tell me what happened before the story started. What happens next? Objective, and the point of view of your central character, and that will carry us forward. Okay? So that's enough for this week, and I'll be posting all your... Uh, your, your next reading is for, from Fat by Raymond Carver. I'll put another public domain story up there I think you'll like, and we'll... Uh, We'll be talk I'll, I'll talking to you or talking at you next week and talking with you during the week. We'll still try to make some occasional uh, chat sessions. Uh, we'll come up with some dates that work for you, and I'll try to post two or three times a week when, when even if I can't be there or you, all of you can't be there, that you'll be available to speak with one another. Okay, goodbye.